It's been a tumultuous couple of weeks for Rob Ford, and while many of the mayor's conservative allies are calling on him to take a leave of absence or resign, much of Ford Nation, we're told, remains firm in backing the mayor despite the scandals. Joining us now for both sides of this perspective, two members of the so-called Ford Nation, Chris Spoke and Eric Perlstein, and two who identify politically as conservative but may not be so enamored with the Fords anymore, Roland Mascarenas and Meredith Lilly. And we welcome all of you to TVO tonight for this conversation. I do want to clarify something before we start, though. Sure. You guys are acknowledged Ford supporters. You voted for him in the last election. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Did you vote for Rob Ford in the last election? No. No, no you didn't. Who'd you vote for? Rocco Rossi. You voted for Rocco. Even though he was off the ballot, you voted for him anyway. I'm a loyal guy. I stay firm in my principles. OK. Meredith? I vote small, so I voted for one of the minor candidates. I like to vote for people that represent me precisely, which means they're unpopular. <laughs> OK, yeah. very interesting. All right, I want to find out, secondly, what kind of conservative you all are. Because you're all conservatives, but that, of course, it's a big tent and encompasses many different things. Start us off. How would you describe your nature of conservatism? Uh, I would say that I'm a fiscal conservative. I'm a social liberal. So I'm not purely conservative in my approach, but I believe in, in responsibility toward the city and its citizens uh, with an emphasis on the fiscal side. So you're a red Tory? A red Tory is a pretty accurate assessment, sure. But I will vote for any party that best represents my interests. Okay. Roland? Well, I'm actually kind of glad you asked that because I'm conservative in principle, but politically nonpartisan. And the reason why I say that is I believe in these two pillars of conservatism, uh, started by the political philosopher Russell Kirk. And his belief was that uh, conservatism was less about an ideology or, or dogma and more of a body of sentiments, quote unquote. And part of that sentiment is putting the collective good, the common good ahead of the individual. So these two pillars of conservatism, one, is economic liberty, mm -hmm. which is von Hayek's The Constitution of Liberty, and the other aspect is social values. Now, social values isn't necessarily through religious communities. It can be, and they play a positive benefit, but it's also through community and through mediating structures. Okay, so um, try English here for me, Roland, sure, okay? Sure, sure. Um, a libertarian in some respects? You? Well, no, I, I believe, what I believe is that institutions play a positive role in our society but we need to be inclusive of all at the same time. And often you can do that outside the bounds of a party. Chris, where are you? So I would be, uh, I would be libertarian. So, so I have a lot in common with most conservatives, probably softer on crime. Uh, I would stand with Trudeau in, in legalizing marijuana, for example. So pretty much have the government get out of our way, let the, let the market kind of uh, manage itself and, and have a very limited role for government, enforcing contracts, law and order, that sort of thing. That's, that's my kind of pure ideology. Got it. Yeah. Meredith. Um, my uh, sort of involvement with the conservative movement has really been through different market organizations in Canada and the United States. So I also consider myself sort of a party agnostic. Um, but I appreciate markets because they are efficient. At the same time, I'm a political scientist. So I focus more on the political than the economic. So um, I'm sort of in between, sort of libertarian, but uh, that's my involvement with the conservative movement. OK. Eric, where would you put Rob Ford on that? We've seen a fairly broad conservative spectrum here. Where would you put him on that spectrum? He's, he's more of a pure conservative in his approach and uh, in, in his dealings with the various social groups. Um, I'm OK with how his approach to the social groups has been working out for the city because he doesn't have absolute control. I'm much more interested in the way he's been dealing with city finances and with the progress of the city as a, as a whole. And on those metrics, how's he doing? I think he's done quite well. Just in terms of making sure the numbers add up and that kind of thing? The numbers add up. I like his approach to the growth of the city. The discussion on subways, even though I'm not totally convinced that they're the right way to go, at least has a vision of the city as a global city and has a long and has a long term vision. So on, on those counts, he's done well. Meredith, where do you put him? I would say that he uh, ran a populist campaign, a right-wing populist campaign, and that he really embodied a tax revolt more than any sort of meaningful fiscal conservatism. Um, he, he promised not to cut services, and he promised to cut taxes. And that's not really a feasible plan, but that's a popular plan. He got elected on it. Mm -hmm. And now that he's had three years to show what he's capable of doing, how's he doing as far as you're concerned? He's had sort of a mediocre Just record. on the agenda, not, oh. not, not the freak show, on the agenda, yes. how's he doing? 
Um, he's, well, I mean, it has, the freak show has affected his ability to lead and his ability to get things done. So uh, it seems like his list of accomplishments is sort of lackluster and um, there are things that don't entirely fit with the image that he's created, uh, like the Scarborough sub subway line and the spending that's involved with that. So I, I guess I'll take whatever positive news I can get, but he hasn't been doing really, I can't imagine that really true fiscal conservatives that voted for him for that reason are really happy with him. Well, Chris, the fact is he, he has acknowledged you have to raise taxes if you want that Scarborough line. He wants right. the Scarborough line. Yes. So he's, he's going along with a tax increase. He is. Is that, a pro is that problematic for you? Um, what would be problematic is, is proposing spending without a way to pay for it. So actually, that's, that's one of the few times uh, where I would uh, support some sort of increase in revenue tools. Uh, I'd prefer he uh, rearrange other spending by the government and kind of prioritize what his priorities are. Um, but I actually think that was a rare moment of responsibility um, just on, on moving away from his dogma and kind of looking at the facts. Okay. Phil Prevel's a guy who writes a lot about the city, and he has a, had a piece in Toronto Life magazine back in the summer. I don't want to read a little excerpt of it for you now, and then we'll talk about that. In late May, Phil writes, as lurid stories swirled of cracked videos, hashish trafficking, murders, firings, and resignations, all coming on the heels of Ford's lawsuits, the alleged ass grab, that was Sarah Thompson, and a reported removal from a military ball for drunken behavior, a forum research poll showed that 40% of Toronto voters continued to be die-hard Ford supporters. Among those who voted for the mayor in 2010, 75% still approved of his job performance. The anti-Ford camp tends to explain this stubborn refusal to accept mounting evidence as a symptom of the culture war between downtown and the suburbs. On one side are the elitist downtown progressives who favor transit, walkability, cycling, densification, lattes, and street festivals. On the other side are the suburbanites who prefer private space, low-density living, commuting by car, Tim Hortons, and backyard barbecues. Okay, Eric, does that describe you? It does not. And, and this is where I might not be part of Ford Nation. I may be part of the Ford Underground. Huh. Those people that do live in the cities but still own homes, still get hit with tax increases and have to pay for those tax increases. They're also the same people that see the city as a big city. The need for Scarborough, for Etobicoke to participate in the transportation system is not completely out of line with their long-term goals because I don't know where my you know, future children are going to live and if they need to live out in the, uh, the Etobicoke or the uh, Scarborough part of town. They should be able to get around too, and the people who live there now should too. So I, I see that as as part of the the full plan. And you actually live in the old city. I do. Yeah. Okay, Chris. How about you? And you also live in the old city. I do. I live at Young and Eglinton, though I am from Etobicoke, the heart of Ford Nation. The heart of Ford yes. Nation. Do you consider yourself part of Ford Nation? Um, I, I do uh, to the extent that I'm not impressed with the alternatives. Uh, so so it's not so much that I idolize him as a character or as a politician. I just see him as a refreshing change from what we, we typically see, not only from past mayors, but also just uh, the field of candidates in, in a typical election. Why did you vote for him last time? I voted for him, um, first of all, I voted for him uh, as, as a vote of support for his policy platform. I think he had a lot of very interesting and good ideas there, most of which he hasn't been able to implement, which has been disappointing. Uh, it was also a vote against George Smitherman, who I think was a disaster at the provincial level, both as the health minister and the energy minister. So, so just weighing those two options, he was by far the best candidate, I think. And why did you vote for him last time? Uh, it was it was in large part a reaction to uh, Miller, and he was the the furthest from Miller. David Miller, the David former Miller, the former uh, mayor of the city. Uh, I lived on Saint Clair for years during the tearing up and creation of the the dedicated streetcar track, and then the tearing up again uh, of Saint Clair. Uh, I was in the middle of the garbage strike, and all of those actions as I watched the situation unfold, really they brought the city together. The garbage strike did, mm -hmm. and just at that point where the city had come together and really taken the matter into their own hands and said, we, we can deal with this, we can come together as a community and deal with this issue, Miller just gave everything that the unions wanted to them. And at that so point, your it vote was, just, was a reaction to that in some respects? It was. Okay, Roland, let me check this out with you now. You didn't vote for Mayor Ford last mm -hmm. time, you voted for Rocco Rossi, but the Conservative won the race in 2010. So were you content on election night to see the Conservative win? I had mixed feelings. Uh, the reason why, I spent many hours, I remember this in 2010, this was a time for me, a great personal time where I became fascinated with politics. And I contemplating who I should vote for, Rocco Rossi or Rob Ford, 
um, I always believed in citizenship. And one of the things that I really saw missing in Rob Ford's campaign, and I never really see in media op-eds, is Rock, uh, sorry, um, Rob Ford does not address the business conservatives. He talks about public-private partnerships, but no business conservative is really going to touch Rob Ford with his history. I, I give a good example is Mayor Bloomberg, who has, has done a really good job of this. In New York. In New York. Uh, Three-term three mayor, when he said at the 2007 uh, party convention for conservatives, he views himself as a fiscal conservative, which is balancing budgets, which is the staple of conservatives, but at the same time, and this is the key, finding innovative ways to do less. Now, there's a really good book that came out this past year uh, called The Metropolitan Revolution. And what it talks about in the United States is that we're seeing at the national and the federal level, complete austerity movements. People are slashing, cutting, there's less and less money. It is up to the cities to be innovative and find different ways to be economically prosperous. Rob Ford has not done that. Toronto is a world-class city. It's competing with Istanbul, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and other cities in the world to be that world-class city. You have to link up with the private sector, which is mostly through growth, through foreign uh, nationals coming to this country, immigrating, and seeing Toronto as a major place. Here's a perfect example, I think, which is a really good example of Mayor Bloomberg. In 2008, during the economic crisis, 6,000 people lost their jobs, uh, and $2 billion was lost in city, rev city revenues. It's from Wall Street layoffs, from Wall that kind of thing. Complete devastation all across. Mayor Bloomberg understood this, so he linked up with the private sector and created kind of private sector initiatives. And when he interviewed over 325 people, who was part of a group, a nonprofit, comes from CEOs, deans of faculty, business leaders, what they saw was a complete deficit, a complete vacuum in the sciences, nuclear energy, and all these alternative sources so of energy. What so what he did was he teamed up with two different universities, Cornell was one, another one from Israel, and he put this out to tender, and the best universities won, and now it's created a lot more interesting stuff around it. And your point is, Mayor Ford, hasn't done anything like this or couldn't do anything like this or hasn't got the chops to do anything like this, that kind of thing? Yeah, Mayor Ford is, the way I like to say, he's well-intentioned, but he needs someone to kind of rope him in. And Doug Ford, who I believe has a lot of potential talent, he, he's in a tough, he's caught between a rock and a hard place, being his brother on one hand, but also knowing his, his brother's shortcomings. Okay. Meredith, you did not vote for Rob Ford last time, but no. he won, yes. and you are conservative. So were you content at the end of the night, election night, 2010? Um, I thought that it was a little bit funny because I did see a lot of outrage among my friends that when he was elected and I didn't think it would be a big deal and I was wrong because it has been a big deal. Um, I think that the sort of those class distinctions that you read at the beginning that he r has really defined his campaign and his mayorship um, by, I don't think they're meaningful and I don't think that they really exist. Um, and I think that they, that that was one of the major things that turned me off of uh, Rob Ford as a candidate was that he sort of operated in that unreality uh, from the very beginning in how he created his image. Well, I, I must say I've been covering politics for about 30 years and never has there been a day like today. We want to play a couple of pieces of tape right now. The first is from the scrum that Rob Ford gave on his way into his office at City Hall and then I'll set up the second one after that. First clip, roll tape. Oh, and the last thing was um, Olivia Gondak. It, it says that I wanted to eat her pussy, Olivia Gondak. I've never said that in my life to her. I would never do that. I'm happily married. I've got more than enough to eat at home. Incidentally, wearing a Toronto Argonaut sweater, and the Argonauts put out a statement later in the day saying they were very, very disappointed with the mayor's conduct and did not want to be associated with any of that. Uh, the mayor of Hamilton also today said that the traditional bet between the Tiger Cats in Hamilton, the Hamilton mayor and the Toronto mayor usually make a bet before a playoff game, of which there is this Sunday. The bet's off. There's no bet this year. The mayor said that on the way in. That was in a live scrum, carried live on television. And then a few hours later, he came out with an apology. Roll tape. The revelations yesterday of cocaine, escorts, and prostitution, has pushed me over the line. And I used unforgivable language. And again, I apologize. These allegations are 100% lies. 
Okay, his wife was not in that shot, but she actually was there. She was present at the news conference where he offered that apology. Okay, Eric. This is, the, this is your guy. Nobody wants to hear their guy say anything of that sort on, on television. Um, it makes for great headlines. It will get picked up by every TV station and every newspaper, and that's what they're going to focus on. But it has nothing to do with running the city. The actions of the councillors afterward, turning their backs to him when he spoke, it's just so childish. The entire situation has become incredibly complicated, and I wouldn't point that finger exclusively at Rob Ford. There are a lot of parties to blame for what's going on. I'm not saying that... There's a lot of parties to blame? There are quite blame? a few parties to blame for what's going on as a whole. Explain. His mistakes are clear, and they seem to be continuous. But how it has been handled by the media, how things have been handled by other councillors, no one is doing their job well, by turning what away. Do, what don't you like? Hey, you you can't turn your back on someone who's speaking, who's attempting to function, and this is what happened after that scrum in council. You're just exacerbating the situation. Everything is is just gotten out of control, and no one's doing anything to make it much better. Chris, this is your guy. It is yes, and I am uh, probably of the camp that says big deal. He's uncouth. He's unsophisticated. Uh, I get much more outraged when I see councillors trying to ban plastic bags or, or implementing a land transfer tax. That uh, affects me, so that matters to me. If I see someone being ineloquent, being Rob Fordish, it, it makes good uh, news for the chattering class. It, it makes a news cycle, but it, it's not a policy issue. Uh, it doesn't affect the way the city's run. It might affect the perception and, and make him a little less effective. I don't see it as big of a deal as, as the media uh, probably is making it out to be. Meredith, your view. I thought it was horrible. Um, I thought that it seemed like he had um, thought about that ahead of time, like he was thinking it was a pretty funny joke to say. And the point of the joke was to defend himself against these allegations in the recent police investigation. But the butt of the joke was his wife. And I think because I had just read some of the recent investigation, and there are a lot of um, instances reported there of sort of sexual harassment, and other shady things with him and different women, to have him come out and defend himself at the expense of another woman in his life was sort of shocking to me in a way that defied just even the language that he used. Your view. So for me, this is the part where I strongly disagree with these two. And, and I hear this constantly over the media and it just aggravates me. You know, it's, it's the media, it's, just, it's the media circus, it's, it's not his policies. But let's be clear on this for a couple of reasons why. The first reason is when Rob Ford started showing up late to work, people were asking him, where is this guy? He's the leader of a city, he's not there showing up at work, he's not doing his job. Secondly, when he starts missing council meetings for his football, a sport that I love and a sport that I've coached, and giving that as a legitimate excuse, his whereabouts are not there to be found. So that's one aspect. This is a, a world-class city. We need to take pride in this city. We cannot uh, allow a petty, small-minded counselor to ruin our city. And the second aspect is this aspect of, oh, Toronto's the news. You know, I was in Michigan last week. I went to get some milk at 8 a.m. It's CNN and Rob Ford's on. And all the convenience store owners are just kind of laughing at this. What would you think of that? It's tough to hear. You know, I'm very patriotic. I'm very strong. I'm very proud to be Canadian. I'm very strong about being from Toronto. But it's really tough to look at. And there is a psychological concept. It's called organizational identification. When you see the profile of something lower and it becomes, uh, loses meaning, loses purpose, people don't want to associate that with it anymore. And Rob Ford has a lot of good ideas. Eric, I need to ask you this. What would Rob Ford have to do that he hasn't already done? And I add this caveat that all of what we th have heard about him it, are in police reports that have yet to be proved in a court of law. But what would he have to do to run the risk of losing your support? It's not what he has to do. It's what someone else has to do. Someone else has to stand up and say, hey, I'm, I'm with this guy on policy. I believe in what he stands for, but I will give you this type of leadership without the shenanigans, without the insanity. Anybody else doing that? No. And that is a really re no. None that none that has come to the attention John of Tory? many people. You know, John Tory his name comes up quite a bit. 
And well, no, he's a good, no disrespect to John Because he's a mature Corey. conservative guy without he, the freak show. He is, but for some reason, he just has a habit of losing. He seems like a perfect player on the Leafs. <laughs> he's got all the talent. He just can't win. Well, hang on. <laughs> just for argument's sake, he did win the Ontario Progressive Conservative leadership. He and then won a by-election afterwards to get into the legislature. Now, it's true. He lost the next couple of things. Right. So he's two and two. <laughs> He's a reasonable candidate. There just aren't all that many. He, his support, a lot of people now that I've spoken to, his name does come up all the time. There's a lot of head shaking going on. He's great on the radio. Um, Chris, what would Rob Ford have to do that he hasn't already done that would make you say, okay, that's too much, I can't support him anymore? Um, I'd echo Eric's comments. He'd have to just be worse than, than another candidate. And not just in terms of policy and seriousness and gravitas, but also in terms of his ability to actually win an election. Uh, so I'm a Rob Ford guy to the extent that he is the conservative front runner. If it's Rob Ford or Olivia Chow, I'll vote for uh, Rob Ford. If it's Rob Ford or a more serious um, conservative candidate, again, with big, bold ideas and some sort of actionable plan to put them through, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely shift my support. Well, admittedly, it's early days. And look at the campaign, I'm, I guess, Figuratively, it started, but technically, it doesn't start until people file their papers in 1st of January. Uh, and Rob Ford says he'll be first in line to file his papers to run right. for re-election. Karen Stintz is on city council. Denzin Min and Wong is on city council. They're both thought to be moderate conservative voices. John Tory is thought to be a moderate conservative voice. Are they conservative enough for you not to vote for Rob Ford? They are, uh, but again, it's about the, the race is going to break down uh, a left wing angle and, and a right wing side. So a front runner is going to merge on each side. My, my support usually comes at the last minute when it's down to the, the two options. Um, so I hope that there's a more serious conservative uh, candidate, again, not just because of the shenanigans that Rob Ford's been uh, embroiled in, but also because he hasn't been able to execute against his platform. And that's really what I voted for. I voted for the ideas in his platform. But just so I'm clear, at the end of the day, the fact that he is a conservative right. and you support his agenda right. is more determinative of your vote than the freak show that comes along with it. Absolutely, yes. Can you understand why that would drive some people crazy to hear that? Yes. And I think it drives people crazy. I, the people who really focus on politics, who make it kind of their daily habit to follow what's going on at city council, it drives them crazy because that's their life. Um, when uh, Roland said Rob Ford is the, is the leader of the city, I don't think he's the leader of the city. He's the leader of the city government. The city is much bigger, much broader, much more interesting, much more dynamic and diverse uh, than what's going on at city council. I'm still proud of Toronto. The fact that our mayor says stupid things doesn't change that one iota. Meredith, the general rule of thumb, I think, when you're a reporter and you cover this stuff is we're not going to get involved in politicians personal lives as long as they can continue to do the job do you think that what's happened in this mayor's personal life has rendered him unfit to do the job I do because it hasn't stayed contained within his personal life he's involved in this larger investigation that surrounds him um, he has been drunk at work and or allegedly he has been drunk at work oh, allegedly they, okay oh he did do that today <laughs> uh, they said that they found uh, a joint in his drawer at work they said that he um, offered jobs to women if they would smoke marijuana with him all of these things affect his performance on the job his ability to build any sort of consensus at all has been entirely diminished I gather because of these personal failings and how how politicians are able to build networks and build coalitions does reflect on them personally and that is but is also a broader part of their job and of being able to get anything done. Roland, do you think he's lost the moral authority to govern? I think those two words is exactly what he's lost. Denzel and Wong has said that we can have different arguments about his policies, about his leadership and what his role. Moral authority, a staple part of conservative thought is social values. Is, is governing from within, a conscience. He has, on every aspect, destroyed the conservative brand and his base. But let me make the argument that I suspect his side would make, which is, uh, I never put myself up as a role model. I put myself up as a guy who would privatize garbage, get rid of the vehicle registration tax, keep your taxes low, and end the gravy train at City Hall. Now, that's what he said he would do. He didn't say he was going to be anybody's idea of Prince Charming. So? Yeah, that, that is a fair point. But what I'd say to that is that he's representing a large swath of constituents in the very diverse Etobicoke. 
I mean, how many times have we heard Etobicoke, Etobicoke, Etobicoke linked with Rob Ford? Whether he likes it or not, he is representing those constituents. And a, lo a large part of Etobicoke is working class or, or uh, first generation immigrants. So they're going to be attached to Rob Ford wherever, wherever he goes. And loyalty is a two-way street. Rob Ford has used that loyalty in one way, but he hasn't reciprocated. Eric, uh, do you think he's lost the moral authority to govern? Moral authority and politics have gone their separate ways, and I think that happened a long time ago. There have been countless issues with political leaders. Uh, it's not my key factor in determining whether someone's going to run the city. What is a key factor to me? And again, I am a homeowner. I pay the tax. I know how limited the sources of municipal funding are how complicated it is to spread them out against, against the services that people are requesting all the time over such a large area. Let's get to the business of running the city. I'll worry about moral authority later. I'm not so affected by it. And I'm willing to give a little bit, I'm actually willing to give a lot on moral authority to make sure the city functions well and keeps improving as it was just voted second best city in the world, highest ranking it's ever received. Maybe he had nothing to do with it. It's still under his watch. You say you're prepared to give a lot on moral authority. You prepared to give this much? So far, if there is a better option, if someone says, as I said before, hmm. I can do this okay. without this moral issue, that person will have my vote. Okay. Uh, let's move on and talk about the liberal media here, small L liberal media. Here's Sun News host Ezra Levant talking about the media's laughing Rob Ford had a news conference last week, and when he got to the end of his statement, some members of the media were literally laughing. I guess because I wasn't there, but I guess they thought that what he was saying was so laughable, they started to laugh. Roll tape. That laughter and mockery, really a heckle, a counterpoint, came from the news reporters who were there, from the media party. They wanted to kick the mayor while he was down. Fair ball, I say, for voters to do. Maybe Rob Ford does deserve to be thrown unceremoniously out of office, but for the news reporters, I mean the media, the word media means middleman, by the way, for the middleman, the news media, to cease to be the objective middleman and to become a judgmental filter, to become the uh, official opposition to Ford, to become the official prosecutor of Ford, well, that's almost as interesting a story as Ford's foibles themselves. How would you rate the media's role in all of this? I would rate it as having been uh, unfair. Uh, so even, even to that clip, uh, the media laughed during that scrum right after Rob Ford said, God bless the people of Toronto. And I think they laughed at that statement specifically. And I think what it, what it did is it revealed this, this kind of gap between the people of Toronto, especially in, in the inner suburbs, a lot of whom believe in some, some God uh, of whatever religion, and, and the media, which has some sort of homogeneity that doesn't apply to the rest of the city. So they laughed at this man for saying, God bless the people of Toronto, because that's so, that's so uh, Republican-American, that's so un-Torontonian. And, and I think people, uh, they don't like, people don't like seeing that. They don't like seeing uh, downtown elites, I, I hate the word, but downtown elites laughing at a man after he's just given a, a heartfelt confession saying God bless the people of Toronto. I think that's, because, again, I wasn't there, but my hunch is because they didn't think the confession was heartfelt. They thought it was conniving and they thought it was um, staged, probably written by his brother, to sure. make him look good. That's, so, the laughter was presumably derived from that. Right, so, the, so they're reading his mind. I watched that same scrum. I thought it was heartfelt. I don't know. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But they're, they're the media. They're supposed to report objectively. They're supposed to film it, ask their questions, let the people decide. That's not what they're doing. Okay. Meredith, your view of how the media has handled all of this? I like it. I like um, really close scrutiny of politicians. I wish that there was more of it. I find the media bias uh, perspective a little more persuasive if, if it's about reporters who go too easy on politicians or newspapers that just sort of regurgitate press releases and things like that. But the political power holder of, as a victim of these mostly young reporters is just a narrative that I don't buy at all. And um, I think that this kind of conservative media uh, report of biased media like we just saw there, it's more of a sales tactic than it is like a journalistic perspective. It's just, it gets you outraged and draws people in, and then he starts badmouthing all of his competition so that you won't change the channel. So I think, I mean, there's a whole separate set of interests there. And I think 
it's strange as a conservative, as someone who would want to limit power to take issue with reporters scrutinizing politicians. That's interesting because most conservatives I talk to over the years say the, me the media have a built-in uh, animus towards conservatives. And you're a conservative and you like the media coverage. I so do. I find that interesting. Well, I think that if they made a mistake, then you can write in and they'll correct it. Like if it's something as intangible as a bias, you can't really sense that. And I think it's admirable that they that they strive for balance at least because we do all have our perspectives and the truth lies somewhere in between all of that and it's, at least they're trying, at least they're not identifying as an ideologue within the reporter profession. Eric, you know, it has been a bit of a pattern that Mayor Ford says something that he later then regrets and feels a need to apologize for and could the media laughter at that news conference be related to that? They have seen this movie before. The mayor says something the mayor regrets then later in the day saying it. The mayor then apologizes for it. Yes, it could have been interpreted many ways. It was an interesting statement that he made to end his, uh, his little speech, and the reaction was interesting as well. It could be, you know, God bless the people of Toronto. They need protection from you. It, anything, <laughs> anything could be thought of. But he did not make a good friend of the media from day one. And the media is not in the business necessarily of reporting the news. They're in the business of selling newspapers, because if they don't sell newspapers, people don't get to keep their jobs. And it's a lot more interesting and entertaining to have something on the front page on Mayor Ford. He's got a, his caricature than okay. it is to, to report on well, maybe a billion dollars plus that we as Ontario taxpayers will have to pay for the Liberal government's cancellation of you're the gas that, plants. saying that didn't get reported? It did, but it's still an issue. But it was always back page stuff. It was front page for a few days. I'll, I'll take that back. Not Hang nearly on. this a, much. A, a billion dollar gas plant which everybody agrees was an egregious political decision by the previous uh, Liberal government. You say that's only had a couple of front pages? And, it and has then... had nowhere near the exposure that Mayor Ford has had. Nowhere near. There's, there's a little typhoon that just hit the Philippines with thousands of people dead. Mm -hmm. Toronto has a massive Filipino community. That's even relegated to secondary news. Right now that's happening because it's not nearly as interesting as the shenanigans in, in, uh, in Mayor Ford's world and in, in City Council. So media ought to be blamed for disproportionately giving this the kind of attention you think it doesn't deserve? I'm not blaming the media. I'm just explaining their role. Media is there to sell papers. They're not there to bring you the truth. And that is clearly evident depending on which channel you choose to watch at home. They're either going to take the right-wing slant, the left-wing slant, but they're appealing to individuals. They need them to keep watching and to keep reading. They need to keep selling papers and to keep selling advertising. That's all true, but the suggestion is that they're holding out Rob Ford for special treatment. And I'm thinking right now, if the Prime Minister or the Premier were in a drunken stupor smoking crack at midnight in his or her office, you don't think there'd be any front page <laughs> coverage of that? Ezra did a great job in that piece, if you watch the piece in full, of discussing the situation with Rennie Levesque in the 70s when he, maybe he was drunk, maybe he wasn't, hit someone. It's 40 years them. ago. Times have sure changed. Sure enough. Times have changed. But it happened. It happened, and, and, our, and our times have changed. That's a lousy ex Sorry, Ezra, that's a lousy <laughs> example. Media cover things differently today than they did they 40 do. years and ago. That, maybe that's actually my point as well. Yeah. They do cover things differently, and this is part of that difference. What's your view on how the media has covered all this? Well, I mean, we see kind of an interesting different perspectives. I will tell you this much. You know, I'm a person of faith. I don't remember the media ever coming to, to, to watch me and supervise me when I'm donating food to the homeless, which I did for many years, or my family. I remember, remember them talking about Sorry, the... Sorry, why, why would they or should because, they? Because when... Think about the amount of pages they've devoted to abortion, pro-life, pro-choice. But a lot of what's below the surface, a lot of the positive things of communities of faith, they never, ever report. And whether you, you're a Sikh, you're a Hindu, you're Christian, you're Jewish, a lot of positive things come out of faith, which are never, ever in the media's newspapers. Again, why would they or should they? Media cover news. News is about what's controversial. It's about what's new. It's about what's different. It's about, it's about what's unusual. You dropping off food at the food bank, <laughs> sorry, is a lovely thing, but it's not news. But you know, I would beg to differ on this reason, because if you look at the online media, when you look at Gawker, when you look at Jezebel, and when you look at young people who devour social media, so much of it is this feel-good stuff about people doing th things uh, uh, to give back, donating philanthropy and so forth, and that's covered in kind of the new media, but it's not covered in the old media. But guess what? The new media is taking over the old media for that reason. We'll see.
<laughs> Stand by. Um, let's try this, Chris. What do you think the biggest misconception is out there today about Ford Nation? I think the biggest min misconception is that it's a, a homogeneous entity uh, of, of kind of these uh, almost mindless followers who, who don't care about any of the new headlines that are, that are emerging in the papers and that just support their man for some inexplicable reason. But you have kind of said that today. No, I, I support him for policy. That's, that's why I started right. supporting him and that's why I still support him. Headlines be damned though. Um, headlines be damned, yes, but, but I, I, don't think, I don't think that the, uh, the mainstream media has taken Ford Nation uh, seriously as, as a group of individuals. It's just this, this thing that exists. Right, uh, I, I see some sort of parallel to the Tea Party. Right, we, we don't see a lot of analysis of individual policy positions and why they might be attractive and ob objectively desirable. People have to keep watching after we're done because we're going to have an analysis of that very thing with a U of T professor okay. who will explain um, and analyze the, po the popularity around Ford Nation and why Rob Ford won the election a few years ago. Sure. How about you on that, on that issue of what the biggest misconception is about Ford Nation? that there are a bunch of people from the outskirts, that this is low income, uh, a low income group, that's not necessarily the case. There are a lot of folks that uh, have reached out to me over the last uh, several weeks as the news has reported all of his uh, foibles and strange occurrences. And they have said, look, uh, we, we may be the last people to, uh, to still support him. But there are a lot of those people saying exactly that. High income earners hard-working folks who live in the city and have to pay taxes and really feel what policy does to their lives, there, uh, there are quite a few uh, Rob Ford supporters there as well. And that's you two guys. And that if, actually describes you two guys. If Go I could just add, I've heard someone uh, once say that, that what Rob Ford did well uh, was co-op the language of the middle class, of the blue-collar worker, and that it's just been this marketing campaign. And I think that does a disservice to Ford Nation, where a lot of people who classify themselves as Rob Ford supporters, it's more than just his rhetoric. It's about his policy. It actually is. And I think a lot of, a lot of journalists, a lot of, a lot of uh, Ford antagonists, they can't understand why someone would support Rob Ford. He's, he, he's uncouth, again. He, he's, he's unreasonable. Um, what, what are the pros? But the pro, if you look at, at his policy, if you look at what he stands for, especially in light of what else is happening, what the alternatives are, I think that makes him more sympathetic. And that's the last word on this today. Thanks, everybody, for participating. I have to say, there are some elements of this story that are rather crass, and we don't normally cover crass on this program, but uh, this story is um, pretty unprecedented and pretty hard to ignore. So thus, we've tried to have, uh, and I think we have had, a pretty civilized conversation about what is a very strange day in the history of our capital city here in Ontario. Thanks very much for participating, everybody. Appreciate it. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.